director of the Carleton University School of Architecture from 1983 to 1986. He has uh, lectured extensively worldwide. In 1984, Dr. Perez Gomez won the Alice Davis Hitchcock Award for his book, Architecture and the Crisis of Modern Science, and is the author of numerous other important publications, including uh, Polyphilo or the Dark Forest Revisited, an erotic epiphany of architecture, and Architectural Representation in the Perspective Hinge, co-authored with Louise Pointerre. Um, this book has particular relevance to me. As a graduate student in architecture, it allowed me to form connections between uh, explorations and inspirations in two, -dimensional, uh, in two dimensions as an undergraduate student in painting um, to the entirely new and at first seemingly foreign language and tools of the built environment. And as a professor, I find myself turning to it again and again, using it to shape the pedagogy of my teaching and continuing to inspire my research and practice. Perez Gomez's most recent book, Built Upon Love, Architectural Longing After Ethics and Aesthetics, which will provide some of the themes for tonight's lecture, is no less powerful in its consideration of the relationship between ethics and poetics in architecture. It is my honor and privilege to present Alberto Perez Gomez. Philosophical logic. 
understood as the very possibility of perceptual meaning or sense in architecture, it concerns emotion and longing, a seductive and even terrifying quality, destabilizing through its novelty, yet also recognizable as familiar, and thus capable of bringing about an attunement of human life with cultural and natural orders, resonant also with the German concept of Stimmung, referring to an environment or atmosphere, milieu or ambiance in French, would be translations that are perhaps more appropriate than atmosphere in English, but understood in our Western architectural tradition as harmony. To unpack my hypothesis, I believe we must first recognize the historical complexity of our discipline, one that has both shifted with cultural changes and in some ways also remains the same. Though addressing deep and often similar human questions, architecture provides diverse answers appropriate to specific times and places. It is naive to identify our shared tradition of architecture with a chronological collection of buildings understood as useful creations whose main significance may have been to delight through more or less irrelevant aesthetic ornament. This definition, associating architecture with the fine arts, dates only from the 18th century and hardly does justice to the broad changing historical definitions of our field in human civilization. A few simple examples may shed some light upon this observation. In ancient Greece, for instance, there was no word for architecture. This is quite paradoxical, you know, if you think of the Parthenon. There was no noun. There was, however, a word to name the architect, meaning in most cases the principal craftsman. The architecton's responsibilities included the crafting, the crafting of defensive weapons, such as the shield that you see in this slide, or the shield of Achilles, if you have read the Iliad. Wondrous bronze sculptures, uh, ships, textiles, and also, of course, buildings. Yet, the architecton was also a dramatic character in the theater, in place, like the character of Odysseus in the satire play Cyclops by Euripides, a character that was responsible for making possible a cultural order, an original social foundation often in the absence of a divinity in the plot. You know, and it had really nothing to do with building buildings. It was more to do with opening up a space for social order. During the, during the European Middle Ages, and I'm just giving you a few examples of, of how, this, how the discipline really is much more than we sometimes believe it is when we think about the history of buildings. During the European Middle Ages, Architect, with a capital A, was a term associated with the Judeo-Christian God as creator. And sometimes it was applied to the bishop or the abbot that may be the patrons of a building enterprise. So it's the patron, actually, who is more closely connected to the architect. The master mason, of course, executes. At the time of the Renaissance, once the creative capacities of individual humans potentially endowed with divine minds were acknowledged. The architect became closer to something that is familiar to us. Yet, despite the associations sometimes put forward between architecture with painting and sculpture, most famously by Vasari in the 16th century, architecture always remained distinct in approach and methods of representation and included the designs, the design of machines, always kind of mimetic uh, of the cosmos, of the, of, the, of the workings of the heavenly bodies, fortifications, gardens, stage set designs, and ephemeral structures that we would today connect with theater, as well as buildings. So the field is vast. You know, Palladio spent a year, for example, designing uh, ephemeral structures for Venice, 
for him they were as important as designing buildings that you know are more permanent. Indeed, a more careful appraisal of our architectural traditions and their changing political and cultural contexts suggests a different way to understand architectures, what is proper to architecture, its, its uh, own universe of discourse, so to speak. Which I think operates in the realm of what a very interesting philosopher from the 18th century, Jean-Baptiste Vico, called imaginative universals. Architecture may then be understood as a discipline that over the centuries has seemed capable of offering humanity through widely different kinds of incarnations, right? Different objects, in fact. They are not, uh, you know, they don't seem to belong to the same category when you look at them in this way. Far more than superfluous pleasure or a technical solution to pragmatic necessities. Architecture is manifest in those rare places that speak back to us and resonate with our dreams. It incites us to real meditation, to personal thought and imagination, opening up the space of desire that allows us to be at home while remaining always incomplete and open to our personal mortality. Unveiling a glimpse of the sense of existence and actually revealing our limits rather than hiding them, as often technology does. My, my discussion leads by necessity to the valorization of the poetic imagination of the architect, a controversial position for our world of complex interrelated environmental problems, in which planning and democratic consensus seem to be the only obvious answer. In other words, from my point of view, to speak of architecture as a mere product of social or economic forces misses the point. While granting the collaborative nature of our discipline, you know, from, from the beginning to, the, to, to, to modernity, doesn't make any difference, a personal imagination with deep cultural roots has been at work in the most moving architecture from the past. As I have suggested, the products of architecture in the Western tradition have been varied and included more than buildings. This genealogy started indeed with the so-called Daedal of classical antiquity. Uh, you, must, you probably recognize the connection between Daedal and Daedalus, right? the, the, the name of the, of the, of the first architecture that we have a story, uh, that we have a story about him. Um, these are actually objects uh, named in, in the Homeric poems, in the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Theogony by Hesiod that were eventually attributed to this man, Daedalus, the first architect, um, uh, whose story is actually quite fragmented, but that has come down to us through actually classical uh, fragments from, you know, like written, of course, supposedly much later than the time when he actually lived. This, um, these objects, as I already suggested, included ships, temples, and deceptive war machines, for example, like the Horse of Troy, uh, what these artifacts had in common was harmony. They were all well articulated, like a human body that has uh, were good working joints, all having been put together from small parts through, through these carefully crafted connections. That's what actually the, 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 the term joint in, in ancient Greek is harmony. Does the word, the word harmony. Vitruvius continued this tradition in the first architectural <coughs> theory text that you, I'm sure you have heard about and that, had reached, and that has reached us dating from the first century of the Christian year. He includes among architectural objects, sundials, machines, and buildings, all capable of meaning through a mimesis of the cosmos, reflecting through their order the star dance of the heavens, as Plato says. And this kind of, uh, this idea that there's an order up there that we can contemplate, that is connected to mathematics, and that can be in some way brought down to heaven and uh, 
implemented in buildings, in machines that work according to similar orders, and in the gnomon, in the solar, you know, in the in the sundial that allows for orientation, that allows to understand where the north is, the south, the east, and the west, and actually the point of departure for the foundation of the city. So all these things, all these objects that if you read Petruvius and you you don't hear this story, uh, it seems to be strange. Like why would he connect machines to sundials to buildings? Actually connect precisely in this manner. The Greeks qualified all these artifacts made by the architect as thaumata, which means wonder. This was their main purpose, wonder, conveying wonder, both fear and admiration, a form of beauty grounded in eros, which of course ultimately refers back to sexual desire. Thus, Vitruvius, I don't know if you have noticed this, declares that besides solidity and commodity, that is to say, a good structure and the fact that the building has to be appropriate to its use, the third main quality of architecture is venustas. Now, venustas is a funny word. It has been translated as beauty by later theoreticians. But there was a Latin word for beauty at the time of Vitruvius, which is pulchritude, more connected to hygiene. Vitruvius used the Nustas instead deliberately, clearly to note the quality of Venus, Venus Tas, right? It's the quality of Venus, as you see in the, in the slide. Uh, Aphrodite for the Greeks, the goddess of love. Thus, architecture must be able to seduce and by inspiring desire, make evident to the inhabitant the significant, yet limited and finite nature of the space of human dwelling. This was still clearly, on, this is very different, of course, from beauty understood in, a, in the sense of composition or 18th century aesthetics, right? That is supposed to be detached from and not affect you emotionally. This is totally the opposite. It's supposed to affect you emotionally, to hit you down here, rather than just intellectually. This is uh, very important to, to realize. This was still clearly understood during the Renaissance by most architects and theoreticians. It is a quality altogether different from formal composition in the sense of modern post 18th century aesthetics. Renaissance architects created veritable wonders generated from drawings, literally magical images, governed by proportion and geometry manifestations of a human imagination that have gained independence from divine will, to propitiate a good life in a dangerous world, the world of the Renaissance, where nature, I have to remind you, was not mechanistic. Everything was alive yes, and threatening, and linked through sympathies and antipathies. It is in this world that the, 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 you know, the work of the Renaissance architect participated. Architecture sharing this intentionality has also been conceived and built after the Baroque period and during the last two centuries. But this work usually appears as a practice of resistance, whether in exceptional buildings or often in the form of theoretical projects against the more conventional understanding of architecture as either functional shed or ornamented building. I can really elaborate a lot in a short lecture like this, but I would like to tease you with some examples, pointing out some relevant features of these practices. Piranesi, during the mid 18th century, is perhaps the first to question the reduction of lived space to geometric Cartesian space. It's the idea that somehow. Uh, you can assume that the space where we live is geometrical, that the space that you design in your computer screen is the space where we live. Yes? This is really, uh, you know, only, you know, only being understood in, in the beginning of the 18th century. Pianist is already reacting against this. Um, <clears throat> his poetic architecture is inhabitable to the imagination, yet deliberately unbuildable 
particularly the second stage of the Carcieri, like I showed you in the slide. Um, uh, as a transcription of the drawing, you cannot transcribe the drawing. If you want to build this, you have to translate it into something else, right? You have to imagine a different dimensionality of lived space that is not uh, uh, homologous to the, to the third dimension of perspective or form Z or whatever, or CAD or whatever program you're using in your computer. Uh, and, and that is already a challenge that he offers. He knows what he's doing. He calls himself always an, an, an architect, you know, and he actually uh, rejected a lot of commissions because he, he thought that it was a very limited uh, uh, what he could do actually in, in, in building compared to what he could do in, with his etchings. So it's a very interesting story. Uh, to be honest, we could spend a whole lecture on this, of course. Thus, his exploded perspectival constructions temporalize space and deny the homology of perspective with orthogonal drawings, as many architects of his own time were already taking for granted. Later in the same century, Jean-Jacques Lecoeur uses the very methods of descriptive geometry, which are actually a kind of graphic method uh, that is used by, it's really the, the, the privileged and indispensable reductive tool of the Industrial Revolution, right? To be able to design precise machine parts. It's basically nothing other than Cartesian geometry made into a system. I, I probably have never heard of it because, because it's now implicit, actually, in what the computer does. But this idea that, 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 that uh, you know, uh, you have a matrix of 3D with three planes, X, Y, and Z, and you put something in it, you project it, of course, in all directions, and that describes with precision the piece or the object or the, or the building that you are making. This is actually something that is invented. It's not just going with the territory. It was not always there, right? In fact, someone in the late 18th century actually wrote pretended uh, geometry descriptive to actually codify how to work uh, this, uh, this process uh, for engineers and for, and, and for architects. In any case, Jean-Jacques Lecoeur used the same principles but actually turned them around, using them ironically. It's, it's very interesting what he does. To eroticize space in his theoretical projects, including an emphasis on materiality through writing, he actually wrote on the drawings, right? and, and the invention of programs. Indeed, <clears throat> the, the, the creation of new spaces of participation, alternative political spaces at the end of the Ancien Regime, you know, the Ancien Regime is really the, the old political structure, the king, right? It's really what uh, preceded, of course, the American Revolution, and what preceded, and what happened in France, this is what I'm talking about. Yes, the, 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 at, at this point, uh, the, this uh, old uh, uh, political spaces could no longer operate. So the architects immediately became concerned with that, and Lenin is one of them, who tried to make an architecture dream programs that would create an alternative social contract, taken actually from, from Rousseau, uh, quite a bit of this. Uh, this is really the guiding quest in, in the city of Shaw. It is an incredible theoretical project that published in this big book. Yeah. Evidently for Ledoux, architecture is meaningless, if not participatory. Its formal invention must include a vision for a poetic life yes, of society and a concern for the common good. By the mid-18th century, just to, to keep this in you, right, and give you just little pointers here, Le Corbusier, after having embraced for many years the axonometric space of modernity, recognized, mostly through his practice as an artist, you know, he used to paint six days a week, every morning. He took this very seriously, you know, and, and constantly thought that this was really his laboratory to understand questions of spatiality. And then the challenge really for him was to translate what he discovered into, into buildings. Now, it took him his whole life, actually, to, 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 to do this, actually, you know. Um, but, uh, but in his late architecture, he, he, he basically recognized how the, that the significant space is, is one that reveals an enigmatic depth. The space of desire uh, that could be translated into building. 
projects like La Tourette, uh, for instance, accomplish just that. This is a monastery uh, that he designed for the Dominicans uh, close to Lyon in, 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 in France, uh, which is really paradoxically nothing to do with Catholicism or dogma. You know, he really turns the program on its head uh, and rejects traditional rituals. And through a historical understanding and, and a surreal sensibility, he builds instead, instead, instead a place that I would actually argue uh, accommodates a kind of ecumenical spirituality, one that has its non denominational, it has nothing to do with traditional religion, uh, and really manifested again as an impenetrable space of desire. It's interesting the stories that, uh, that, that the, the the Dominicans that saw the place under construction tell, for example, you know, like what we see in the beginning when he was young, he was obsessed by building exactly what the office produced, like everybody, you know, the working drawing has to be built exactly. He was very concerned about, about this precision. When, when uh, Le Corbusier, when uh, La Tourette was being built, he actually celebrated the mistakes that he found when he visited the work. Uh, the, the, the people that did the concrete there were not used to, to making buildings, they were uh, used to making dams, apparently. Uh, uh, but he liked that very much, and he always celebrated that. So he actually understood that there is something in the process of translation between the build, between the drawing and the building that enriches the building rather than, than, than uh, you know, this obsession with uh, closing the gap. Uh, the other amazing story uh, that actually connects a little bit with the quote by Malcolm de Chassal on, this, on, the, on the slide is, is this observation by one of the monks there. I spent a few days there, you know. You have to go there and stay, you can. And it's really, it will change your life, believe me. You should try it if you, if you can one day. Uh, anyhow, this guy who, who knew Corb and had seen the whole thing on the construction, he said that the only time that this chapel that I'm showing you there actually fulfilled its function was when Le Corbusier died uh, in the Mediterranean. He drowned. Uh, he was taking a vacation. He was uh, on, you know, uh, he had a little kind of primitive hut, beautiful space, amazing space actually, uh, that he designed for himself. Uh, uh, anyhow, he drowned and he had left instructions that if this happened, in fact, if everything seemed too staged to be true, his body should be taken there to spend the night. You know, this is a normal Catholic thing. Uh, and this uh, Dominican said that it's the only time where the chapel has actually worked for a purpose. Right? Because, because the chapel is actually very uncomfortable for traditional rituals. Um, like I said, everything seems to be, uh, everything is possible there. You can, you can sleep, you can eat, but everything is made difficult. Uh, you are aware of, the, of this space which is almost impenetrable. Uh, the other thing that you notice is that, uh, that uh, unlike uh, the, the traditional Christian churches that usually celebrate light, uh, this one seems to be about to exclude it. The detail is such, if you look at the, you know, the slabs and the corridors, uh, even, the, even the detail that you see there at the, at the, behind the altar, that it's like, a, you know, the, this is, seems like a mechanism that is about to close and make everything hermetically dark. Uh, so this is, it's very interesting, you know, I think you know, the, 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 the Corbusier understood something very important towards the end of his life. Friedrich Kiesler, another 20th century architect that you may have heard about, uh, through a very different formal search, tried to understand endless space as a metaphor for the surrealist convulsive beauty. He was actually part of the surrealist movement. Um, <clears throat> Also, a space of desire in a non stylistic architecture, making the inhabitant of this house, which he calls the endless house, our new sacred space, aware of his or her limits. It's really not about blocks. Huh? This is not a formal concept, it's actually a programmatic concept, mostly. And it's, it's very interesting if you take the time to read what, uh, what uh, Kisler was after. There are, of course, many other examples that can be cited, ranging from Haydock's uh, famous masks to, uh, I think, Libeskind's Berlin Museum, which is perhaps the only work of his that I really admire, uh, from Leverance's wonderful churches to Barragan's uh, moving houses. My point is that most crucial to works of architecture in the sense that I evoke 
is not the capacity to communicate a particular meaning through some formal syntax that we may identify maybe like, like you know, the latest fashion, the one that works. Uh, it is interesting to note in regards to the slide in front of you, for instance, the deep admiration that Le Corbusier had for Gaudí's work, which you might not imagine, given that their work is so different, right? So it's not about, about form necessarily, but rather the possibility of recognizing ourselves as complete. That's the issue of architectural meaning. In order to dwell poetically on earth, and thus be wholly human. This recognition of wholeness, it's, you know, that we feel complete, is not merely one of semantic equivalence. Rather, it occurs in experience, and like in a poem, its meaning is inseparable from the experience of the poem itself. The moment of recognition is embedded in culture. It is playful by definition, and is always circumstantial. In other words, you know, you could tell me what the poem means, you don't write the poem. If you could tell me what architecture means, you could actually paraphrase it, then it becomes futile to make it. Right? That's I, the, the point that, that, I, that I wish to make. When successful, architecture allows for participation in meaningful actions. It's what we call programs conveying to the participant an understanding of his or her place in the world. In other, world, in other words, it opens up a clearing for the individual's experience of purpose through participation in cultural institutions. In this way, architecture offers societies a place for existential orientation, and its meaning is bounded by time. Vitruvius, again, provides a fine example when he describes the manner in which the theater, that important, very important ancient institution, conveys its sense to the spectators as they participate in the event of dramatic representation, you know, as they attend a play. He says, well, he talks about the circular plan, you know, and the circular plan, he says, of course, is mimetic of the cosmos, like the drawing shows from uh, 16th century edition of Vitruvius. It's 12 divisions that, that you know, generate the parts of the building, emulate the order of the zodiac, he says, right? The order of the, of the stars. And proportional harmony is crucial. Yet, this is very important to, to, to grasp, the meaning of the building is not given as an aesthetic experience, again, in the reduced sense of modern aesthetics. It is not in the details, the materials, or our experience as tourists or voyeurs. Rather, and I quote Vitruvius here, it is conveyed when the spectators sit with their pores open in a performance, and the whole event purifies. It's a catharsis that allows for the spectators to understand through their participation in the space of drama which is also, of course, the space of architecture, their place in the universe, and not only in the universe, but also in the civic world. Yes, it is well known that, for example, in the festival, in the, in the festivals in, in spring in Athens, the Dionysian festivals, uh, the, 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 the traditional tribes that constituted Athens from time immemorial actually had special seats, allocated seats in the auditorium. So it's both civic, and, uh, and, and, uh, and natural, right? It's culture and nature together. Uh, and the catharsis is both about understanding and about feeling. Yes, it's emotional and it's intellectual at the same time. You are moved by the music, by the, by the, by the unlikely actions of the play that are always surprising and, uh, and uh, actually hard to take if you know uh, classical tragedy. Uh, so, so there is that dimension, but there is also the, the dimension of understanding in place in the world. And this is what art, how architecture becomes, you know, is legible. Right? I think it is important to realize how it contributes to society. Thus it follows that architecture's disclosure of beauty and meaning is, if you like, 
ephemeral because it happens in the present. Yes, it's not there forever. It's not objectifiable. Mm -hmm. Yet it has the capacity of changing one's life in the vivid present. Exactly like magic, or indeed, exactly like an erotic encounter might transform us. In this sense, it has important resonances with the insights of surrealism from the 20th century. Like falling in love, architecture's disclosure of beauty strikes a blow that reveals reality as it is. Reality as it is. This was Socrates' formulation in Plato's Symposium. He insists, you have to fall in love in order to understand it. You cannot circumvent love by giving some rational argument about how you would suffer or how you might make the person you love suffer, etc., etc. You have to fall in love. And this is, uh, Socrates says, the one thing we know for sure. This experience provides a foundation for all other further articulations of truth in, 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 for humans. Therefore, it can be said that architecture embodies knowledge, but rather than clear logic, it is a visceral, carnal, even sexual, and therefore opaque uh, experience of truth. It's interesting to remember in this, in this connection and in connection to, uh, to Socrates' uh, 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 statement, which may seem very strange for a philosopher to make, you know? Like Plato says, the only reason to be born is to make love. It's the one, the one thing that makes life make sense. You know, so these, these philosophers understand reason, but understand how emotion is crucial to reason. And modern neuroscience, like, you know, cutting edge neuro, neuroscience, is now talking about precisely these things. You know, we, all, we often think of emotion clouding reason. Well, there is this man, uh, Damasio, uh, he's written amazing books about this problem, uh, the, the Cat's Error, for example, and, and a few other books, uh, who, of, he's a neuroscientist, you know, and he has actually demonstrated that when the centers of the brain that control emotion are damaged, you cannot think properly. You cannot plan. They are together. So it's, it's an interesting thing to, 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 to remember when you think that our neutral world, that we rather prefer to navigate through GPS, so it's completely flat, is actually okay. Because you know, it doesn't affect anybody. Right? I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's very crucial, uh, em, you know, emotion to be able to understand. So, since this is actually the nature of architectural meaning, uh, it is impossible to objectify. You cannot reduce it to functions or to ideological programs or, or formulas, uh, typological. Uh, of, of any kind. And this is particularly important for modernity, I think. For it actually seems that when buildings become idols or signposts, you know, like, a, like the logo of a corporation that you can really read clearly, they actually lose their capacity for edification, to convey proper meaning. So, uh, in fact, there's another philosopher that speaks about this problem who claims that, uh, that, uh, that for this reason, contemporary artworks, including architecture, should rather allow us to see through to meaning precisely by not restricting it. In themselves, not the meaning no single thing, right? Reducing as much as possible the denotative aspects of, uh, of meaning. Following this reflection, I would like to invoke Plato and argue, this is a, you know, a difficult topic, that beauty who you probably all think is relative, right? As a form of deeply shared cultural experience, understood as a priori meaning in cultural worlds, is a fundamental category and indeed is not just relative. This is the experience that produces catharsis in the theater, as I uh, described for you a moment ago. In Fetris, the experience of beauty is a vehicle for the soul to ascend towards truth. Pteros, it's uh, the way that the gods call Eros. 
provides these wings to the soul. So beauty, in that sense, is truth incarnated in the human realm. It is a trace of the light of being that mortals can seldom contemplate directly. Now, in other words, that may be more familiar to us, we can understand it as the purposefulness, the purposefulness of our environment, mimetically reflected by artifacts, and grasped by human consciousness, yes, 80% of which is pre-reflective. This is again, uh, you know, leading edge cognitive science. Right? So this is, I mean, you, you know, you know, many of us can have uh, nihilistic thoughts, right? We've had nihilistic thoughts many times, probably, uh, ever since the 19th century. Why doesn't the whole civilization go home and slit their wrists? Right? It's an interesting question. It really has to do with the fact that our consciousness, what we think about, is barely 15, 20% what is reflected. You know? It, 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 it's the pre-reflective that really drives us. Um, following from this reading of Plato, a contemporary philosopher, well, he just died, uh, Hans Georg Gadamer, has argued that while we can be deceived by what only seems wise, or what merely appears to be good, he says, even in our world, uh, of, you know, in our contemporary world, all beauty is true beauty, because it is in the nature of beauty to appear self-evidently. So it's really about this, uh, you know, uh, affecting us, in, in, uh, our, the perception of understanding purpose. Yeah, so there's always a, you know, it's there. I mean, we cannot really imagine a world without beauty completely, even though we tend to repress sometimes uh, the realization that we really need it, that we need to, to, to encourage beauty. Indeed, it is easy to dismiss taste as nearly subjective, participating um, in local, historical, determined norms. Yet, when we move beyond 18th century philosophical aesthetics, taste, says Gadamer, takes its place among other forms of practical wisdom. Uh, Aristotle calls this phronesis, grounded in the habits and values which we share with others in a particular cultural and linguistic context, and that appear with clarity and certainty as long as we trust perception and we don't, you know, it is of course crucial that we trust perception as the final arbiter in this matter. Yes, there are things that move us and we have to, to, uh, to, to learn to recognize this. So, such self-evidence manifested in the poetic artifacts and stories of our traditions can produce judgments that are no less rational for being grounded in prudent understanding. These works of architecture, art and poetry are indeed capable of moving us. They transform our life and ground our very being. I mean, I don't know you, you know, and clearly uh, I'm old and you're young and you're, you're, the artifacts that surround you, the things that move you are of a different nature. But I know music moves you. I know movies move you, you know. We may have different, you know, I may, I may be able to tell you about some that you have never heard about and vice versa. But we all have had the experience that when we come out of a, maybe, uh, maybe an architectural experience, but maybe uh, more commonly, uh, maybe uh, uh, an amazing movie, right? We feel encouraged, uh, inspired, we say, by what we have perceived. Yes. This idea of inspiration is not a joke. You know, beauty actually is um, a necessity for beauty. You have to really understand what moves you and translate it into your own terms. Believe it. Don't defer to others. Don't look at the internet uh, latest uh, uh, world architectural news for reference. Believe what actually moves you. Right? And that way, you will be much uh, safer ground, actually, to move others. Uh, uh, beauty proliferates, as justice proliferates. Um, Eros 
and the imagination are inextricably linked. This is more than a physiological fact. We know, probably, you probably know, right, that to be a good lover, you have to have imagination. Otherwise, it's not just about physical attributes. Our love of beauty is our desire to be whole and to be holy. Beauty transcends the contradiction of necessity and superfluity. It is both necessary for reproduction and crucial, crucial for our spiritual well-being, the defining characteristic of our humanity. Contrary to the view that there exists some kind of irreconcilable contradiction between the poetic imagination and some kind of ethics based on rationality and consensus, it is the lack of imagination, some have argued, like Richard Kearney, that may be at the root of our worst moral failures. Imagination is precisely our capacity for love and compassion. For both recognizing the other when we fall in love and nobody else sees anything in this person we're falling in love. You know, it's a typical phenomenon, right? Your friend tells you, oh, come on, what do you see in here? You've lost your appetite, you cannot sleep. You know, what is the deal? Right? Uh, so, the imagination is crucial here. And then, after fireworks uh, work themselves out, also for valorizing the other person, their solitude, for understanding the other as myself, over and above differences of culture and belief. Thus, in this last book that Katie Kiley mentioned, I argue for building an architecture upon love, understood both as erotic seduction and as brotherly compassion. Imagination is both our capacity for truly free play and our faculty to make stories and to partake from the language and wisdom of others. We have to cultivate it. Now, sorry, oops. That's, that's fine. This is not, however, a plea for unreflective intuitive action, often associated with the personal imagination. Intuitive, sometimes called artistic work, can be dangerous. Contemporary humanity must assume a great responsibility. For in fact, unlike our ancestors until the 17th century, we effectively make history. We have the technological tools to destroy the world, and this, of course, not necessarily only through war. The technological project goes hand in hand with the self-evidence of human-generated change. The fact that, you know, we think we actually change things with our actions. And this is a particularity of the Western project that now is, of course, universal. Thus, history, our diverse stories, one would say, as varied as our world cultures, is what we share as a ground for action, together with an indeterminate, somewhat sick, natural world that appears always fragmented. We don't share, like our more distant ancestors, a cosmological ground, a perception of the universe as a fundamentally changeless totality, limited and straightforward. I would argue that this was the case, say, from the beginning of the Western tradition, from the Greeks, all the way to maybe the end of the 17th century. And at that point, it kind of starts eroding this, this perception. Only by grounding the architectural imagination in historical precedent through our words can it realize its capacity to create compassionately and negotiate the nearly infinite possibilities for production in view of our now real cultural diversity and in view of the proliferation of instrumental methodologies and computer software, you know now, or parametricism, right? Capable of producing endless novelties. Contemporary philosophers often point out that infinite progress is impossible. The world and its resources are finite. Yet, to project architecture inherently means to propose, through the imagination, a better future for a society. You should think of your projects as a promise. 
It is inherently an ethical practice. And this should not be equivalent to a mindless search for consumable novelties disconnected from history that you can kind of be proud of because there are 10 pulses of, of Japanese tourists taking pictures of it, you know, outside of your building. Let me emphasize the crucial role of the theory based on historical interpretation for an ethical practice. This, is never, this kind of theory is never a methodology or a set of instrumental rules. The architect must ask responsibly and language plays a crucial role, allowing him or her to articulate a position. The word, the word that you speak, the word that allows you to articulate where you stand, the moment you design, is crucial. And it has been disregarded since the early 19th century. From functionalism, you know, functionalism basically is the plea to disregard the problem of meaning, to solve the problem of the plan, extrude the building, and the building will take care of its meaning. Right? To, to contemporary parametricism. I mean, we've all been eluding the word. We don't believe in the word. It's very curious. There are philosophers that actually argue that, the, that the, the, the nature of the imagination is linguistic. It's not pictures. Someone like Ricoeur. I won't get into that because it's a little bit too technical. But this is really uh, important, at least to grasp uh, the, the, the basic argument here. The production of precise working drawings and specifications following building codes potentially actualized through robotic fabrication is obviously not the end of our social responsibility. And its transparency, operating through mathematical codes, creates a really dangerous delusion. While we must grant that words and deeds never fully coincide, they don't, it's true. You know, you intend something and you do something and there's always a, an issue, right? That's what it means to be human. This, I would argue, is to be celebrated rather than deplored. This opaqueness of the languages we speak characterizes the very nature of human com communication, which is never coincidental with a kind of pre-Adamic or pre-Babelian, you know, pre-Babel, pre-Tower of Babel, uh, word of a god for whom to name is to make. This is the Judeo-Christian god, right? He names and makes, and it's one-to-one. Uh, -one. Now, this is not for us. This is not the way we operate. That's the wisdom, probably, of the story of Babel. Like the making of poetic artifacts, the possession of natural, symbolic, multivocal languages, or whatever you want to call them, the languages we speak, is among the most precious gifts that makes us human. I would argue more precious than our approximations to an ideal, scientific, or mathematical universal language that seems to stand for all. Spoken languages are natural to humanity. Part of the flesh of the world, says Merleau-Ponty, that includes our embodied consciousness and its environment. As the brilliant linguist has, uh, George Steiner has stated, our over three and a half thousand distinct languages for a single species, and they were 5,000 just a century ago. They are dying fast. Often in close proximity to each other and mysteriously diverse, and capable of speaking poetically in ways that always enrich our experience of reality, is the ultimate enigma which no evolutionary theory of man can ever reduce. Yes, we are the only species that thrives by having different languages. Even now when I speak, you are translating. Even within language you are translating. This process of interpretation is always going on. It's not transparent. But we have this obsession with transparency, right? Of everything in architecture. So that it's efficient. No matter what we produce as architects, once the work inhabits the public realm, it is truly beyond our control. This is also absolutely true. So an express intention can never fully predict the work's meaning. It is ultimately the others that decide its destiny and its final significance. 
And this happens not only in the architecture, with anything that you put out in the public, you know, like books. I can tell you stories about how my books have been interpreted. Despite this apparent limitation, understanding that there is a terminological continuity between thinking and making, between our words in our particular language and our deeds, is still our best bet. What we control and must be accountable for is our intentions. Despite that usual saying that dismisses good intentions in view of real deeds, you probably have heard that. Well-grounded intentions are rare and crucial, really rare in the modern world, particularly in architecture, because they imply a whole style of thinking and action, a past life and a thick network of connections with the culture, far more than what an individual, for instance, is capable of articulating at the surface of consciousness or through one particular product. This uh, you like connectivity, right? Is the least for me crucial to an ethical practice. Um, it's uh, what Aristotle called practical philosophy. Again, wisdom, phronesis, prudence. Prudence is then a rhetorical skill that involves the word, based on historical understanding, one that has little to do with formal descriptions and stylistic classification. It is essential for the development of a coherent praxis. Praxis I use here, again, in an Aristotelian sense. It's practice, of course, but in understanding that it has always political implications. Yes? You're working for others, for the common good, not for the client, for the common good. You know? And if you have to negotiate, you negotiate. And if you cannot do the project because you don't feel it's appropriate, you don't do the project. Yes? My friend, Johanny Palasma, makes it very clear, says, you know, I don't care about the way the architecture is not a service profession, as they say. This irritates, of course, the hell out of our, you know, some people. Uh, it's not a service profession. We're not in the service profession. We're actually, we, it, the service is actually to the common good. And so it is, it is, this is always uh, something we must remember. Um, to articulate a political position with regards to a given task, indeed, that's what prudence is crucial for. And history, a deep sense of history, not only the history of the last 50 years or since after the Second World War, uh, is the only way that we can have guidance, since it engages alien artifacts to tell us their stories through interpretation, one that acknowledges as positive the potential bias implicit in the questions that we ask and that may be crucial for contemporary practice. So this is, a, you know, it's not a, a kind of collection of, of, of data, yes? History is understanding your questions and using all that we have inherited as humans to find answers. And this is complex, you know, it has to do with our local cultures, but it also has to do, of course, with Western culture, with what Husserl called the philosophical history of Europe. Why? Because this is really the origin of the technological world that now has become universalized. So I find it always necessary to connect architectural ideas to the history of culture, particularly in the Western tradition, to understand these problems. This is not a history about you know, knowing, knowing little facts about the past so you can go and, and impress somebody in a party. It's really a history for the future, as Nietzsche used to say. One meant to enhance our vitality and creativity, rather than one that may immobilize us through useless data, some kind of immoderate respect for the all for its own sake, or unattainable idealized models. The architecture and the words that express the praxis of other times and places must be understood in light of relevant contemporary questions, yet with full consideration of the cultural context of their makers. Thus, the process of interpretation Appropriating that which is acknowledged as truly distant makes it possible to render such voices into our own specific time and politics, rather than assuming a universal language at work or some kind of progressive teleology, you know, this idea of a, a myth of, of infinite progress. Uh, Hannah Arendt, who was a student of Heidegger, used to put this in slightly different terms, you know, the, the real history is. Uh, it's like the, 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 the
pearl fisher who dives into the ocean, you know, in the Sea of Japan, you know, and, and, and extracts from an uninteresting, like, you know, you don't, you don't give a two cents for the shape of the shell of the mollusk, this amazing jewel, right? Because there are things there that are unsuspected. And that's really the, the real historian is doing that. Yes, it's not about dead data, it's about uh, asking relevant questions to open future worlds. Um, <clears throat> the aim of this kind of history, if you like, is to read between the lines and with courtesy, always. Vitruvius has something to tell us, Palladio has something to tell us, believe it or not. Uh, all of these guys have something to tell us, they are not stupid. They live in their own world, they have their own prejudices, but they also ask you questions like we ask. And so, if we don't avail ourselves from this stuff, we are the, we are the poor for that reason. So, read with courtesy the world of the work and the world in front of the work, which is the, this dimension that our own questions produce. Acknowledging that the human pursuit of meaning is present above other motivations. So we cannot just be cynical about history. We cannot think that we're superior because we live in the American democracy. You know, and this is the best place in the world. It's silly. You know, everything, every place has its own qualities. And we all ask the same questions. This means bracketing, for example, the cynical tendencies of Marxist or feminist scholarship that sees power and deceit between most historical artifacts. While also critical, this process of interpretation, called critical hermeneutics by philosophers, rejects the historical flattening and homogenization of the construction and proposes the valorization of experiential content. As I was saying before, the mystery that is human purpose and the presence of spirituality. It has nothing to do with dogma. It's really just purposefulness. To account for what matters and can change our life. Needless to say, this hermeneutic understanding is equally applicable to our engagement with other contemporary cultures. Say you are designing in Saudi Arabia, or if you are designing in Africa. This is very important, uh, this kind of dialogical uh, uh, condition. And should be, I think, at all levels present in, in our education as design professionals. The poetic and critical dimension of architecture, like other relevant artistic products, addresses the questions that truly matter for our humanity in culturally specific terms, revealing an enigma behind everyday events and objects. I am personally convinced that the stakes for change today are really high. I think our built environment is pregnant with ambivalent meanings, exacerbated by the monk impartiality of technology. You know, um, as many neuroscientists and cognitive scientists uh, have said again in the last 10 years, uh, our consciousness you know, is not only inside our, our our skulls. It's in the world as well. Yeah. And perception is action. It's not passive. You know, we change the world. We perceive it differently through our very action. We are making the world. You know, this idea, for example, that you have high definition vision and you can account for that by some kind of uh, understanding of the eye as a little photographic camera is, of course, completely silly. You know, the eye. Uh, it's full of holes, like the, the retinal image, you know, uh, peripheral vision, there's all these, you know, the, the blind spots that don't coincide with one eye and the other. Uh, the, 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 you know, cognitive science has now gone a long way to understand that, that this passive understanding of perception is, it doesn't work. You know, that even the, the reduction of, of perception to the physical five senses is rather silly. First of all, we perceive the world through our embodied consciousness, which is biological and has come to us through evolution. So a lot of our consciousness is actually this animal consciousness, which is 80% of, of our full consciousness. Uh, you know, and it's not passive, it's never passive. It, and the, the senses 
and therefore our, the, the world is given as a crossing between senses. It's what is called synesthesia. You see and you touch at the same time. If you are born, if, if, you, if, 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 you, if you have walked in the snow, you see a kid outside of the window jumping in the snow, and you perceive more than what you see visually, right? It's tactile as well. That's very important. And architecture is all about that. And we, we tend to privilege the visual too much. We think it's pictures. And it's, 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 it's uh, you know, it's much more than that. The, 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 these neuroscientists also talk now about, about um, perceptual modalities rather than, than, than the senses. So that there's something very curious, for example, uh, uh, congenitally blind people, I don't know if you know about this, uh, you can adapt a kind of digital machine now that captures the image digitally and communicates the image through tactile experience in some uh, places of the body that are particularly sensitive, like the, the thigh, apparently. And the congenitally blind people start to describe visual images. Right? So it's much more complex than we imagine this problem. Even now, you know, neuroscientists actually understand. And we architects, we design, you know, we look at the stupid computer screen and we think that this, this space that is generated geometrically is really the place where people will gonna live. And our project depends on the on the on the forms that we're creating. Material is kind of, maybe some people consider it crazy, you know, but it's kind of incidental, you know, you can build these parametric things with chewing gum, it doesn't matter, right? It, it's really tragic, because we are really, like, behind, not only, like, philosophers have been talking about this for 60 years, but now scientists are talking about it, you know, and we have to catch up. Anyhow, I believe that, that for this reason, uh, Things have to change. Yeah, the, the, the world really affects us. It it makes us feel more despair than we should. Right? We can build a better world. You know, we can build cities. You know, just by building cities where we can walk. You know, there are small things that immediately will change a great deal. So, in this sense, I have to really just finish here. It is unimportant if buildings in search of novelty look like circulation flows, blobs, shoe boxes, or spiky stars, or they are biomimetic, or whatever you say. Self-referential buildings expressing no more than a marketable style, a technological process, or a single fashionable meaning play a crucial role in forming, if not increasing, our psychosomatic pathologies and political crises. We need to question the assumed neutrality of techno-capitalism and the false values that often ground our way of living and producing, such as the unceasing pursuit of ever more efficient means, while always postponing an accountability of ends. I think architects, seeking in their work a coincidence of the good and the beautiful, should have a vital role to play in the survival of human cultures. But it will have to be seen. Thank you very much.
uh, and so, uh, but we, we forget that they had this luxury of thinking of the architecture in relation to some, to, 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 a, to an intersubjective order that was given. Right? And it was, there was always this reference uh, between the picture or the geometry uh, and the world. Uh, at, uh, as I suggested very fast, I think this starts to fail at the end of the 17th century. There is an architect there called uh, Claude Perrault, who, who is important for this, who questions this uh, connection between architecture and cosmic picture. You know, and basically he puts forward a, a very instrumental view of theory for the first time ever. You know, he says proportions have no meaning, you just have to have some proportions that are efficient so that you can dictate the mason how to work and so that they can be precision. Right? One to one precision. That's the it's the first time that this happens. It's it's really it, it's really surprising if you don't read the treatises. There is no interest in this prior to the late 17th century. So it's curious. In the 18th century, most architects in Europe that read this stuff and react against Bell, they don't like what he says. They often even accuse him of being just, you know, uh, defending some stupid argument. Because it's self-evident for them that, that, pro that actually harmony exists in nature. That's part of the argument, of course, in the 18th century. But as a result of this uh, uh, problem that Perrault first recognizes, uh, architects in the 18th century start to understand that the best way to go for architecture, for it to have a social meaning, is to use linguistic analogies rather than analogies with nature or with the cosmos. So they talk about something called character theory. From Germain Boffin to people like Boulay, they do their, like, their, their, like, the late comers in this tradition. It's a whole century, you know, and it's, it's, it happens in different ways. The, the Italians call it indole, for example, Tico and uh, uh, Lodoli and Memo, uh, the Rigoristi. Uh, but they are all interested in this question of how you can, to, uh, now um, by using the word, uh, uh, frame your architectural intention so that the building that you build, that is no longer just uh, you know, uh, automatically a symbol of a picture of the world that houses a ritual, now things are starting to deteriorate. So that this building maintains its it's, it's meaning for society. You know, even Richard Sennett talks about this, right? How the, the, the public space in the 18th century basically, uh, from being ritual, becomes theater, very self conscious. Right? Arendt says, from public space, the space of the polis, which is a political arena, the space becomes social space. It has to be constructed. Uh, you know, we have to make social space. So, in order to do that, architects have to use linguistic analogies. And they actually talk about this in many different registers. Someone like Offran says, you know, architecture has to move us like different kinds of literature. Like uh, epic poems have a certain uh, emotion that has, that, that is conveyed, has to do with war and action. Lyrical po poem, poems, you know, it's about seduction. And, and so, so this is one of the possibilities. The other, the tip, you know, the other aspect of this is understanding that architecture also has meanings that can be read in a more denotative way. Like a lot of these architects talk about how you should build a house that represents the person. So you wouldn't build a, a palace with a large board, like with a lot of orders, or even with the orders, if it's not for a prince, you know, because this constitutes a social space. So, architect, but it's linguistic. You see what I mean? So, the, the, you know, it's, there is a desire to express character through 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 a linguistic art, articulation. Boulay and Lebrun do exactly the same thing when uh, they talk about architecture parlante, it's the architecture that speaks. Like Boulay talks about an architecture that emulates the moods of nature, like if it's buried or if it's dark, etc. Then. Seemingly out of, out of nowhere, but in fact this thing had been brewing for a hundred years, comes Durant in the beginning of the 19th century and says, forget all that. It's, it's BS. You know? Don't worry about it. What you have to do as an architect is provide shelter 
you solve the problem of the plan, and the building will speak, will say what it is, like a sign, and you don't have to worry. And so this is really the story of power, you know. What happens in the 19th century is this same attitude is taken to the Ecole de Beaux Arts. Yeah. And because the architects have to maintain their social status, then they do just that in 48 hours. And then they spend a year rendering, making these huge drawings with watercolor. You know, and they call it art. It's actually about presentation now. It has nothing to do with anything. They're presenting the project that they have already, they've solved in 48 hours. You know, and we are caught in that dilemma, you know? Like, we think, anyway, that the rest of the story probably know better. But that's why, and you know, and, 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 you know in the last 20 years, 30 years, it's all this constant desire to extrapolate something from the hard sciences into architecture, right? To, man, to, to try to validate this idea that somehow the only the only theory that makes sense is the one that can be implemented one-to-one. -one. Like you hear the Van Berkel talks about that. Everybody talks about that. That's what it's all about. But what world have we built? That's why we have these funny shapes that can land wherever, right? Some are more interesting than others, I would grant you, of course. But there is very, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing here, of course. I have to generalize to make my point. There is also good things happening. But, but I think this is, a, this is a, the, the real problem, and I think we have to see it clearly uh, to get out of it. Oh, I have a question. Uh, you use the word intentions, well, several times in reference to architecture, but I'm wondering what your position is in terms of intention as a historian. Um, I guess I'm thinking of I mean, people like Michael Baxendahl talking about intentions and sort of um, constructing these narratives out of history. I'm wondering what your position is with regard to, because you talk about precision in terms of architecture, but not in terms of history. So I'm wondering what your position is on that. Precision. Precision, intention, I'm not sure I, um, yeah. Well, I use intention, look, I mean, I, I, I use intention sometimes in a, in a popular way, but sometimes I use it really from, from terminology, so that I don't want to talk about, you know, it's... Uh, so, it really depends on where you quote me, and uh, okay. one would have to contextualize this. Uh, and to express, the, and I think that the, the intentionality in words for me is very important, you know? I, I don't know that you want to call it narrative. Uh, but I think it's, 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 it's um, I mean, Ricard, for example, talks about this, this, this question of uh, fiction and history. You know, they, they, have this, they, they share this narrative form, but they are really quite different. It, for me, actually, the, the, the fictional dimension has more to do with the program, which has to do with the future, and probably is more philosophical, like Aristotle says, whereas the history is more, is more uh, uh, Factual, right? I mean, you're trying to at least uh, pay attention to the world of the work, uh, but at the same time, you are you are dealing with narratives that are responses to your questions, and it's always this dialogical thing. You're always right. I guess I, I'm wondering what the connection is between that and the notion of of Claude Perrault making a you know a, a direct connection between drawing and building. You know, there's like a one-to-one -one connection between that, but is there really a one-to-one -one connection between history and what we say about history. Yes, right. it's not of the same kind. Correct. But that's what I was arguing here, right? That, that, that because there's always this opacity between language and what we make. It's inevitable, but I think that's part of the human condition. I think we're really scared of that. It's been the story of, uh, and it's also, of course, we are, we are put in that position because we are forced to be efficient. And really, from the beginning of the 19th century, we've been asked to com compete with the engineers. You know, that's what Napoleon did, right? It's very well known. He's the first one, the first big sovereign in Europe who said, "I'd rather have engineers to help with architects." And so, ever since, you know, we've been nervous and we, we become nervous about this. Uh, it's, a, it's a curious problem, you know. For me, the, the, it's also a problem that to do with education, by the way, which is very interesting. In the beginning of the of the 19th century, this is a, this is a problem that I that I look at in, in this last book. 
In the beginning of the 19th century, there is this amazing guy called Charles Francois Biel, who was a rather conservative architect. He wasn't, you know, like he wasn't doing anything like Boulay or. But he was a very good, solid architect, doing very simple things, uh, very ethical things, you know, usually have to do with hospitals. And, but he wrote, he wrote a bit. And he actually argued, uh, at the time when this was happening, that, you know, first architecture became like a sub profession of engineering. Just after the French Revolution, the Academy of Architecture was disbanded. And you could only study architecture in the Ecole Polytechnique. And architecture was like something you did before you became an engineer. You know, this is Durand, is the, the, to, to design the building in 10 minutes is just to know how to plan it. You know, that's easy. Um, so then they, these guys migrated to, they associated themselves to the, with the artists with the painters and with the, and with the sculptures, right? And that, as you know, is the origin of all American schools of architecture. Right, they call them that. Um, at that point, this man, Charles-François Biel, was saying, both, both are wrong. Architects are not like engineers. They are not like artists either in that way. There's nothing to do with these fine arts, you know? If it has to be somewhere, architecture, in the context of the, well, by then modern university, it was a university that had become more uh, disciplinary and specialized after, after Napoleon. It, it should be close to the humanities. Not in the faculty of art, not with art, not with engineering. So this is, I think it's really insightful. You know, he, of course, it's uh, how many schools you know <laughs> in the world that would actually go, you know, present themselves this way. Yes. Um, you talked about um, QT being um, not only relative, and duty is some kind of truth. Um, how would you think you can understand this truth of QT in architecture? What's your understanding of um, UE as a kind of Is it objective, or is it a bit of objective and a bit of relative, or is it purely objective? It's, it's always, it's always, it will, this will always be a tricky piece. You know, but the, the only thing I can, uh, like, the, the best way to see this is through, through, uh, through examples. This building that I showed uh, uh, by Corb, uh, La Tourette, this place where I tell you most spend a couple of, of days. Uh, you know, I'm 62 years old. I've, I've met a lot of people in my life, a lot of famous architects, you know, of all kinds of stripes. I, and I always, whenever I have a chance, I ask them what they think about La Tourette. And I haven't met one single what that has been said that this place really moved them and transformed their lives. So I guess that's what I'm saying to make it very simple, right? That there is something from, uh, about uh, this concept of what, uh, what, what becomes significant that is part of the culture that we have to learn to trust. You know, I, I don't believe that everything is homogeneous. This is part of what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you know, the construction particularly applied to literature and to the arts, uh, claimed that things were kind of homogeneous. And if you, you know, you, you could write an undergraduate paper on Shakespeare, that's writing. And Shakespeare's Hamlet is writing. And so, writing is writing. I cannot accept that in my experience. Something moves me, something doesn't. Right? You can logically say this is writing and you know, this is good because it's uh, empowering to the guy or the girl that just wrote the paper. But I cannot deny that certain things move me. This condition is something that can be ascertained culturally from the bottom up. If you try to think about this problem of beauty through philosophy, through logic, through dialectic, you never get anywhere. That's why, uh, this is what I was saying, you know, this is what happened in the 18th century, when aesthetics became a kind of, well, Baumgarten called it Nociologia Inferioris, which is like a, a lower kind of truth. Right? Uh, so it's, it's really that we have to articulate it from, it from the culture, language. There it makes sense, you know. There are certain things that we treasure. They are not made up. We, we shouldn't be cynical about this, you know. Most of it is good. There may have been other musicians in the 18th century that were also good. You know, but Mozart is good, for example. 
and you know, he speaks through the ages. That's the other thing as well, right? I mean, this is the, 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 I mean, one of the interesting things about art. It's particular to the time, but also transcends the time. Um, there are many, there are other ways to, to, to deal with this problem, but, but basically this is the argument that you have to place it, and you have to understand this problem in a different register than through, uh, than through the logic of, uh, of dialectic, of mathematics, well, yeah, of philosophy. It's more practical philosophy, you know, and Aristotle made this distinction. There is philosophy, which is scientific, and there is practical philosophy, which is rhetorical. But what has been said recently, I mean, there is uh, someone, a man, Ernesto Grassi, who studied with, uh, with, uh, with Heidegger, who wrote this very nice book, if you're interested in this problem, called Rhetoric as Philosophy, where he argues that really the, 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 the tradition that goes from Aristotle's practical philosophy through Cicero, through the Renaissance writers that we don't even call philosophers, like Lorenzo Valla, you know, they are really, because they are not understood, they are not philosophers in the same way, they are corrected to rhetoric, to Gian Battista Vico in the 18th century, and to the present people like Heidegger, Gadamer, and Ricoeur, for example. This kind of philosophy, which is constructed with a language from the bottom up, is actually much more interesting as an approximation to human truths than the other one that is caused from the beginning on the model of truth as correspondence or mathematical truth, right? Which may be interesting because it becomes instrumental. It changes the world. But what does it tell you about humanity? You know, like Vico said, you know, we can make many, as, as many hypotheses as we want about the workings of nature, we'll never really know it. That was Vico. Yeah? Because we only know what we make. What we make is language. And we make artifacts. That's what we really know. The other stuff, we don't really know. We can hide, you know, string theory, whatever, you know, whatever works, right? It works. But it's, 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 it's interesting, you know? I mean, this, uh, and I think architecture, the, the nature of truth in architecture is closer to these human truths. That's what really matters. Of course, the building has to stand up. Yeah, we need that too. Anything else? It's nice to have questions. Thank you, because you know this is a huge room, and you, know, you come here and you feel you go back to I go back tomorrow and say, oh God, I made mean, absolutely no sense. <laughs> Back to this uh, this sort of line of, of thought, um, even that you just mentioned, which is what we know is what we make, which is Vico. Uh, Vico is what we know is what we make. Uh, meaningfulness, you know, Ponti talks. Murdo Ponti talks about the sort of condemnation to meaning, of, of you know that we are condemned to meaning, um, and you know if you. If you sort of think through what they're talking about, the sort of embodied kind of experience, um, the act, you, you become more through the act of the sort of make, like you, you sort of dwell in this, right? So I, I, I guess when you're sitting in front of your computer screen and coming up with maybe all of these strange shapes. forms, <laughs> What is the meaning of that? How, how should we understand those things? If, I, I, you know, I, I, is there more than the novelty of shaping in that act? Well, like you say, nothing, the, 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 what makes it complicated is that nothing is absolutely meaningless. Right? We're always reading like physiognomies into the world, for example, right? Uh, so, and we don't necessarily but, make these things. No, exactly, this is exactly, the, the exactly. Result. But I think the, the problem here is not so much how we read the world, how we perceive it, which is true, that according to the knowledge, you are absolutely right. There is nothing absolutely meaningless. But it's how we intend to make it when we design, right? 
It's at that level that I'm talking about um, the problem. Because, yes, not.